Thank you so much for tuning into this session as a part of Looker's um, overarching join webinar series for this year. I am super excited to be here. I'm Katie Amos. I'm a senior digital product manager at Quip. And I'm also really excited that um, you have tuned in to hear a little bit about um, one of my uh, personal favorite topics in the workplace and as a member of the product team, which is experimentation. So today, um, if you've joined, again, I'm super appreciative of it. And what I'm going to speak to you about is how at Quip um, we've been able to employ testing in order to make super confident decisions with the product advancements we're using to scale the business forward. So in order to talk about the topic of experimentation, um, I want to walk you all through an example from my time at Quip, as I said. And the real thing that I hope that you can take away from this presentation is the value that we've seen at Quip from having access to centralized data that's shared between our business intelligence and testing tools, as you can see in this schema here. Um, and given that value, given the shared nature between the two, what we were able to do at Quip was cooperatively and confidently identify a new store paradigm. And when I say that, I mean a completely redesigned front end experience for our shoppers on our site. Um, one that helped us achieve a, some really big swings in the way that we measure value as a business at Quip and also helped us bring the product, the digital product, which is the store, further into the future in order to match the scale of our product roadmap offerings from a hardware perspective. I've mentioned a lot so far about some things which are likely sounding foreign to some of you. I've mentioned Quip, I've mentioned that we have a storefront and we have all of these hardware product offerings. What I wanna give you a little bit of context around before taking along this journey with me is Quip itself. So a little bit about Quip. We are a direct-to-consumer brand and we sell subscription products which are designed to bring delight to your daily routine and guide good habits from morning refresh all the way to bedtime brushing. More specifically about Quip, we are a hardware company. So categorically, we design and sell physical products. And as a consumer brand, um, the primary sales channel through which we're selling those products is um, through e-commerce, our online store. And the thing that I want you all to keep at top of mind when we're talking through the example today is that that store and that sales channel is really the lifeblood of our business. When we're wheeling and dealing in the world of Quip's storefront, we're trying to make big changes. It's really important for us to make sure that we're doing it in a responsible manner and that we have the data and that we feel good about that data to back it up. The other piece of context that I can give you is that the digital product organization at Quip is relatively nascent. So as with that, so are some of our practices that are typically helmed by a product organization or maybe within your technology or marketing organization. And in this case, a specific practice at Quip, which was somewhat new, um, was the practice of experimentation. The final piece of context that I can provide is that as a business in our growth stage um, at Quip, we are at a pretty critical inflection point when it comes to scale. And that applies to a lot of different things. It applies to our product offering. It applies to our internal teams. And from a technology perspective, it applies to the stack that can support all of those things. And so given that we have um, this critical inflection point um, and a need to meet it with a, a, technology, a technological solution, um, the real challenge for us from a digital product standpoint was um, being able to support scale, especially when it came to our product offering, as I've mentioned a couple of times. And what that meant for the digital experience is that we needed to um, bolster our storefront in a way that could effectively sell more stuff. So if you think of a store and you think of the things that are within it, our site is a set of shelves and we have uh, more products that are coming online to fill those shelves. From a digital product standpoint, our challenge was to be able to scale those shelves upwards in order to be able to fit and merchandise more of the product that we had that was coming online. 
And so the way in which we rose to that challenge um, as a product and technology organization was through the practice of experimentation. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, both that practice and some learnings and, and value that we've gleaned at Quip from uh, that practice itself. Um, and I'm also going to talk to you a little bit uh, to come about the technology stack that we implemented and the way in which we implemented it, and also some of the learnings through that process that we encountered in order to um, be able to bring this, this new online experience uh, to fruition. I've been mentioning scale a lot, and when it comes to the specific example I've set up for you all, um, which is the uh, digital product experience of our storefront, um, we had a really specific challenge that we approached by designing and testing into this new shopping paradigm. And as we identified that new sh shopping paradigm, the thing that was important, again, was to meet the needs of scaling to our hardware product roadmap. But the other thing that was critically important, as I've alluded to before, was maintaining the status quo of the performance of our site as well. Um, reason being, again, we're, we're working with a site and a channel um, that has real meaningful business impact. And so the way in which we needed to address it and also evaluate and keep tabs on the results of this particular experiment um, was incredibly important so as not to disrupt the uh, overall operations of our uh, business equipment. When I talk about the status quo, I want to give you all a little bit more context about what I mean by that. Um, so I spoke to you about our mission at Quip, and one thing to call out is that we are seeking to guide good habits, right? And so if you'll look here um, as an example of our uh, previous site, um, when we were setting out to conduct this experiment, one of the things to keep top of mind in terms of the status quo we're meant to maintain um, is our merchandising model. Since we seek to guide good habits, um, we want you to be equipped with the full set of tools for your mouth um, to be able to maintain those habits. And um, therefore, we sell those tools to you in a bundling model of what we call archetypes. Um, this is an internal term, um, but to explain it for a little bit more context, an archetype is one of the three things that you'll see on the right of this screen. It's a toothbrush, toothpaste, or floss. And so given those archetypes, when you ladder in uh, the fact that our business model is subscription-based, the North Star metric that we think about when we're trying to optimize our site and we're attempting to maintain the status quo is a primary metric which we call our average number of archetypes activated per subscription. So again, with that mission of equipping everyone with a full set of tools for their mouth for the, for the best habits and candidly for the most revenue, um, we want to optimize our site to be selling those bundles with as many archetypes as we can. So given three archetypes, as you see here, we want to optimize the average number that people are subscribing to all the way up to three. And so when we're looking at the performance of that site and we protract it over time, we're looking at the um, value that we're getting from that recurring revenue when it comes to the number of archetypes to which our users are subscribed. The other thing about uh, the status quo at Quip, um, when you consider our mission, is that in seeking to bring delight to your daily routine, we have a product offering which is really highly customizable. So that means we've got many different materials and colors for you to choose from, amalgams of those archetypes that I've just described, even payment plans, um, all of these things with which our customers can customize their plan and their subscription in order to um, have a routine that uh, fits them. When you take into account all of those uh, personalized and customizable aspects of our product offering, um, it translates to the need to focus not only on this primary metric, which I've described for you, but also on this whole host of other metrics which we use to measure both the health of our direct-to-consumer channel 
as well as the product performance. So this kind of looks like a laundry list here, um, but it is a set of metrics for which we were responsible and needed to keep a really close eye on when we were endeavoring to run this set of experiments and come up with a final uh, result in terms of the output of the, the variance that we would test. That's a lot about how we were thinking about what to look at when we were conducting this experiment and uh, really trying to scale the shopping paradigm. The other thing that we had to consider when standing up this experiment was how to actually do it technically. As I mentioned before, experimentation was a net new practice at Quip, and so part of that involved an actual implementation aspect to it. So if you'll look here, you can see how we effectively set up that implementation, at least initially. So as I mentioned before, we have two tools that we're relying upon, um, Optimizely for experimentation, A-B testing, and Looker for our data analytics. Thinking back to the metrics that we just discussed, when it came to the primary metric, those average subscription archetypes activated, it was fairly easy for us to instrument that metric and employ it when using Optimizely. The nature of experimentation is binary, it's an A-B test, and so having a singular metric to which we could assign success or failure was um, somewhat straightforward in that sense. But the thing that made it complicated, or the thing that we, as I mentioned, had to keep top of mind were all of those other uh, direct-to-consumer and business-as-usual metrics. And so for these, we were looking at analysis of our experiments using Looker. And the two had an interplay between one another in terms of the ultimate decision that we were going to need to make. We would need to determine a winner. We would need to determine statistical significance using Optimizely. But we would really need to understand the overall impact by doing some deeper digging um, within Looker itself. The eventual shape of our stack, which you can see here, um, was supplemented when we introduced Segment. And Segment was really valuable to us in this sense because with that tool, we were able to instrument a consistent set of events that was able to be shared across Optimizely and Looker. And with that shared set of events, it established a singular understanding of data across each. And that really eliminated the uncertainty that we'd been seeing before and afforded us the ability to feel very confident about the results that we were getting and thereby come to the business with the actual final set of results for this experiment. And now the exciting part is uh, the set of results themselves, the outcome of this experiment that we were conducting. If you have a look here, you can get a preview of what that looked like. You can also take a look live if you go to getquip.com. Um, but with these final results, effectively what we'd done is conducted three iterative experiments. And by the end of the third experiment, we'd identified uh, a new champion for our shopping experience. One that fulfilled the mission that we'd outset up front, which again was to establish a shopping paradigm that could scale to meet our hardware roadmap and also um, ended up outperforming the status quo that we were seeking with this variation on the site. This is what the status quo looked like for us in more granular detail. If you'll recall those host of metrics that we looked at before, everything uh, with this new store variant was passing with flying colors. And on top of that, we had a couple cherries as well. One was when we looked at our primary metric, again, the average number of archetypes activated per subscription, we saw that this new store variant was selling on average 6% more archetypes. When you protract that over time, that is a really meaningful material value that, that represents for our business. In addition to that, um, when we were looking at the likelihood that people would subscribe on site, we saw that increase by over 8% as well. And again, considering the uh, lifetime value that that represents, these two things combined with the fact that everything else was looking good um, 
was a really compelling story that we were able to tell about this uh, new store variant that we had. And because that story was so compelling, it really translated into a very easy and seamless turnover in terms of the feature set on the site, which when you consider uh, the context that I'd given you before in terms of the level of importance and risk associated with making this move, um, the fact that we were able to do it so easily was really telling, um, and we were able to tell that story through the practice of experimentation. Beyond the experiment itself, uh, I'd mentioned before that the practice of experimentation was nascent at Quip. And given the opportunity to conduct the experiment I've walked you through um, and also establish this as a discipline at Quip, um, we've also borne a lot of fruit um, from an organizational standpoint as well. When it comes to the um, actual reporting practices and data analysis, once we got the uh, data stack into a place where we could confidently rely on it in a consistent manner, we were able to free up time for our resources and headspace to be able to drill down into some of those metrics deeper than we'd been able to before, as well as identify and uh, track down opportunities to instrument new metrics um, with which we hadn't previously measured the business um, but that we'd identified as helpful along the way. So that was helpful to us in terms of a data analysis standpoint and a practice that we uh, have at Quip. From a business standpoint, I think the thing that was really impactful and meaningful to see was that uh, the practice of experimentation um, through this initial set of experiments was um, a really great example of fostering discourse and dialogue with the business. Um, and being able to bring to the table the ability to have informed and introspective conversations in a way that with our partners beyond technology and digital product, we could help uh, make more introspective and informed decisions about business as usual operations beyond um, the scope of our store or our digital experiences. But when it does come to the digital product organization, um, this was also a really meaningful outcome for us, which was um, the practice of experimentation was something that we'd been able to foster confidence and alignment on. And given that those two together, what this really translated to is a sense of preparedness um, that was shared around the organization. And with that buy-in that we were able to garner, um, we were able to uh, subsequently roll out the practice of experimentation to other product managers within the team, which effectively allows each of those PMs to be able to push their roadmaps forward and build on top of their feature sets with more efficacy than they'd been able to previously. That's all that I have for you today on the topic of experimentation. I hope that um, it was helpful for some of you and that some of these tips and thought starters can help you consider how you might use the same practice at your organization when you're approaching big decisions that can help it scale. I want to thank you all for joining me today. Very appreciative of your time and your participation in the webinar series overall. I am very happy to answer any questions that might come up, any follow-ups or guidance that you'd be seeking on this topic, assuming that it's something that you want to learn more about. If you'd like to, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn and reach out. Either way, thanks again for your time. Very appreciative of your participation and hope that you enjoy the rest of the session.